Okay, thank you. So, uh, firstly, thank you for uh, INCF for inviting me here to give this talk. Um, I will talk about brain atlasing and databasing in the Brain Minds project. So, what I actually want to do is focus on brain atlasing and how um, the atlas that uh, I've been uh, working on has is is used as a, a a common space and a way to organize all of the the data that's going into the database in this project. So for those who don't know, um, the Brain Minds project uh, started around five years ago, so it's, in the, it's, it's halfway through. And the goal of this project is to map the structure and function of the common marmoset at the micro, meso and macroscopic scales and apply these results to the diagnosis and treatment of human disease. So it's one of Japan's large-scale brain research programs, and it consists of a, a large number of independent labs. I know in, in the past it was around 65. So this is, this is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, the independence allows people to pursue their, their research interest, but uh, it makes it more difficult to organize data if you want to put this into a database. So in the past five years, um, in the neuroinformatics unit that I was a member of, uh, the infrastructure and basic systems to register, store, and share data with metadata was developed. And so this is a diagram of the system that was developed. It's, um, it, it's basically an internal database uh, with 1.2 petabytes of storage and an open database. And data can be registered into the internal, internal database by this research portal interface. Uh, there's also a high-performance computing cluster that's connected to this um, storage. And then the open data is accessible by the data portal. So <clears throat> currently there's a large amount of raw um, trace and MRI data that's in this internal database. Uh, and the next step is really to compile and a large amount of data that can be shared publicly with the, uh, shared openly with the public and also develop the website that goes along with this. So this uh, is the current website. If you have a look at it, it still needs a lot of work and that's the, that's the plan in the coming five years. So what data do we want to focus on for the, um, this open database? So actually, we will focus on the meso and macro scale structural data for the open database. Uh, part of the reason is we have, a, um, in terms of the neuroinformatics uh, activities, we have a strong, um, a research collaboration with the groups that are involved in this data. And all of this data will be organized around the Brain Minds 3D Brain Atlas. So the, computationally, there's a transform that will take you from the individual data to the, this common space. So here is a, kind of a summary of the types of data that we, we, are, we have been collecting and are organizing. So we have a large amount of trace injection data. Um, the plan for that is an example of the, da the data sizes. So this trace injection uh, studies is, study is using the tissue site system. So the, the goal is to have around 200 brains after 10 years, and each brain, the raw data is four terabytes. So you can see that it's taking up a lot of space. Um, in the next five years, we plan to get uh, adult brain ISH for around 1,000 genes. And high resolution MRI with a 9.4 Tesla uh, MRI system, along with the diffusion um, weighted imaging for all of the brains that have trace injections, uh, cytoarchitectonic maps for a number of brains, resting state fMRI, and the functional data will be, we hope to integrate that into the open database, but it's not yet decided which data that will be. So I want to talk about the Brain Minds 3D uh, Marmoset Brain Atlas that um, is being developed. So <clears throat> I worked on this and I published on it and this is based on uh, Dr. Hashikawa's uh, cytoarchitectonic annotations. The, with this was uh, also compatible, the nomenclature is compatible with uh, the Paxinos Atlas. So that's, um, if, you, if you were here yesterday, Piotr uh, uses this, um, this atlas, so um, this is one step towards interoperability. And if you see here, the, the, the key point is that the NISL uh, sections have been uh, 3D reconstructed and aligned with the MRI T T2 contrast. And we have the annotation, uh, the parcellations here, and we also have the divisions between the, the brain boundary, the gray matter, white matter, and an estimate of the mid-cortical surface. And the, the best thing is that it's in nifty format, so it's very easy to use in your software. 
So we've also been upgrading this. So now we have a population average um, uh, 25 based on population average MRIT2 uh, weighted image contrast based on 25 uh, scans. And this has been mapped with the Atlas, so now we have a very nice kind of MRI contrast that is being um, from the same scanner um, being used in the project. We also created a flat map, and there's, um, this, this uh, parcellation is 116 regions which corresponded, corresponds to the original Atlas divisions. And there's also an ag aggregation of this, so some of the MRI studies want to use a coarser grain division. So how is this atlas being used? I want to spend a bit of time describing a use case as to how this atlas is being used and it will also give you an idea of what the type of data, what type of data is being collected um, in the project until now. So if you remember, you might remember some, this, uh, this uh, marmoset brain figure from Piotr's talk. In his work, they're doing retrograde um, trace injection studies. And in our work, we're doing anterograde trace injection studies. So we inject here at the source, the anterograde tracer infects cells and causes them to express fluorescent proteins that travel down to target sites. So the idea of this um, trace injection connectomics is we do this for a number of brains. Um, we computationally um, process this data and reconstruct it, map into a common space, and then we can uh, generate a connectome of the marmoset brain. So what does the tracer signal look like? Uh, here's an example. So this is generated from a Nanozuma um, batch slide scanner. It's one of, the, one of the techniques that has been used in the project. So this bright signal is the tracer signal. This is the white matter. So this is a coronal section of the marmoset brain. If you zoom in, you can see that these are the axons. And where you see the blurry, blurry, blurry regions, this is the out of the focal plane. So what is the actual procedure um, that you take to, to go from raw data into some matrix of connectivity? So you have the raw data. You want to 3D reconstruct this raw data, map it to a common space with an atlas. You also want to segment out the tracer signal and you also want to identify the injection site. And using this information, you can add one row into your connectome, uh, connectome matrix. So if in this case, uh, for, this, for, this exam for this use case, the experimental data that we, that we acquired, so we have injected the brain. The brain is sectioned using, using a microtome, and at the same time, block face images are taken. So if you assemble these block face images, they're all aligned, and you can get a, um, a stable reference of the brain shape. And two traces are injected at once, so you have green and red. So there's a correspondence uh, between the, the fluorescence images captured by the nanozuma and the block face. So the idea is to map uh, these fluorescence images to the block face so you can get the 3D reconstruction. So just in terms of steps, this is the first step. You want to isolate the block face from the, the, the dry ice that it's surrounded in. Then you have a 3D reconstruction of the, um, of the ex vivo brain. And then the idea here is to register the population average MRI to the block face. So this is in the individual brain space. This top line is the horizontal sagittal, sagittal and coronal uh, views of the uh, individual brain. And the idea is to, once you've registered this, you can slice the MRI registered into the individual space. And instead of using the block face, which has low contrast, you're registering the the, the averaged MRI signal, um, sorry, you, you're registering the, the fluorescent images to the average MRI signal, which is shown here. And in this uh, procedure, I'm using the ANTS uh, normalization tools, both linear and nonlinear registration. So once you've done that, you can recover the shape. And you can also, so since there's no interslice consistency in the reconstruction, <laughs> You can also use this approach, which basically removes high frequency distortions in the registration, and you can effectively um, align and reconstruct the, the full brain shape in a, a more reliable manner. So if you, if you look at the cerebellum here, then you've got a more smooth, a smoother reconstruction. 
So, so in this Nanozuma slide scanner, they wanted, uh, the experimenters wanted to capture the very faint tracer signal. So unfortunately, this sometimes saturated the injection site. So what they did was they took separate images of the injection site at lower um, exposure. And so this is just showing that um, we can take these separate images, uh, isolate the, the cell bodies, and map this back into the 3D reconstruction, then into the common space, and we can recover the injection site uh, volume. So that's it there, and you can also see where, where it was, the brain was punctured. So what does the reconstruction look like at the end? So if you just took all of the slices, the sections, um, and from the, taken from the Nanozuma slide scanner and stacked them by the centroid, you'd get this kind of distorted uh, re brain, re uh, as you can see here. But if you use this reference brain and you use um, computational techniques to align everything, you can recover a, a, the true shape. And actually, this bulge here, is this, this brain's a bit deformed, so that's not a error. So you can see that one problem is how do you, so the next problem is how do you actually segment out this tracer signal? So the, the images from this Nanozuma slide scan are not stable. They, the intensity varies and there's nonlinear um, illumination distortion. So removing the linear variation is not too difficult. But as an example of the nonlinear kind of low frequency distortions and in intensity, uh, if you look at this region of the coronal section where there's strong tracer, if you just threshold this out at this some set value, you can, you can isolate this strong tracer signal. But if you're also interested in capturing this weak signal, you, you need to reduce your, your, the, the level of your threshold. But at the same time, you're getting some uh, background fluorescence of the brain. So how do we deal with that? Well, artificial intelligence has, uh, has become so popular now. Uh, we trained a UNET architecture on manually created binary masks. So we sliced the large um, uh, fluorescence image into small regions, manually drew masks, it took a very long time, and tried to, tried to use this neural network to characterize the different kind of features that appear for the tracer, and also ignore the background, which can be bright as well. So as a result, um, we could successfully do that. So here's a, here's a close up of the, the occipital lobe. And if you zoom in further, you can see this is the trace signal, very dense. And we can also segment it. So this is after um, binarization. And this is a video of the result as well. So this is a zoom in of the one coronal section and how we can use AI to segment out the tracer signal. And this image is very big, so it's three gigabytes, 16-bit um, image at 50,000 by 50,000 pixels. So in order to process this image, we had to divide it up into smaller regions and then apply the neural network. And what does this result look like once we map everything into the um, common brain space? So here's some reconstructions. Uh, this is for one injection into MT, but this shows the first row is the um, green uh, channel of the one tracer and this, the second row the other red tracer. So if you look closely, you can see this is the injection site here and the injection site here. And what's interesting is even though these are both in uh, MT, uh, the green inject, uh, I think, let me see. The red injection was injected more superior and the green injection slightly lower. And you can see how the projection uh, varies even though the injection was done into, into the same region. So this is also why it's interesting to study um, the, in, I think, intrinsic connectivity or the, the connectivity within regions and not just make a summary region to region in, in these type of studies. So to normalize the data further, what, were, what was done was the Neuroanatomist actually annotated each of these brains being used in this um, trace injection work. So now I made a pipeline to convert the, their annotations into 3D. So now we have individual cortical atlases for each brain, and we can use this information to further normalize um, uh, this data when you map, map into the um, 
common brain space. So this, this also helps us validate our results. We, have, we, have, we don't have to rely on a single parcellation scheme. We have actual some cytoarchitectonic evidence for the, the brain boundaries. And how we use this information, we actually try to align the data in the cortical flat map space. So 2D to 2D flat map space is a bit easier to align than, than full 3D. Um, and this is the final result of two, inject, uh, two injections, oh sorry, uh, four, two injections per brain and two cases. So uh, you can see the injection site here. This is the cortical flat map, anterior, posterior and superior inferior. And yeah, so very small injection here. And actually this, is, this shows that um, this is just the, the, the way the flat map of the individual brain was warped into the common flat map space. So the next step after you've got this file, you want to summarize all of the connectivity from a large number of injections. So this is just showing that um, going from this kind of um, data, this, this kind of image, image data, you can quantify it further and look at some summaries of the connectivities um, within and across hemispheres. So moving forward, as I mentioned, this was from a Nanozuma batch slide scanner um, and we were, we're going to move to, well, it's already been in, in, in process. So in, pre in the previous five years, there was a number of trace injection activities. So one of them was using a batch slide scanner, another was using the tissue site system. And now the project has consolidated the efforts into this tissue site system for superior data quality because with the system you are sectioning the brain and imaging it all together. So with that you can reconstruct the, a very nice um, 3D reconstruction. You don't have this alignment problem when you're working with the data. And just as an example, so now this is the tracer signal in, uh, mapped into uh, an, a common space and then also um, to characterize different trace in different regions, the cortex and some subcortical structures have been uh, delineated. So, in summary, I've talked about brain atlasing and atlasing and how it's been applied widely to the brain mind studies. So the plan for this atlas is that we want to upgrade this. We want to upgrade the atlas by using information from multiple brains. Um, as you saw before, we have um, cyto uh, site architecture maps for individual brains, and we also have been collecting diffusion weighted imaging. So all of this data can be used to uh, improve the atlas. In terms of databasing, so the BrainMinds database infrastructure has been established. Um, it's, it has been, it's been used for sharing of the raw tissue site data, uh, raw MRI data um, within the project. Um, but the, the open database has not been developed um, um, to a sufficient degree. So that's, that's what we want to focus on in the next five years. How can we um, share a lot of this um, valuable marmoset um, experimental data? And another, another thing that is quite obvious is from this is that we can pursue inter interoperability with other marmoset data, data sets, um, specifically via the atlas that we have built. So if you, if you were here yesterday, then you would have seen Piotr's talk on the Marmoset Brain Connectivity Atlas. All of their data is retrograde tracer data and we're collecting anterior grade data. So it, it, it's a very complementary data set and it'd be very nice to look, look at ways to connect these two and study it. So um, thank you for listening and uh, please talk to me if you want to know anything more. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think the Marmoset now is really quite an exciting project. I never thought it would be developed so nicely when I first time heard about that. I thought it's just a curiosity of some sort, but uh, no, it's really very important. So, a few questions, please. Yes. Another one there. 
very very nice mm -hmm. talk. Um, Thank you. Congratulations for the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a question about the choosing injection site. This is more for the like starting of the uh, sorry. Uh, could you choosing injection site? Yes, what yes. part of the cortex are you guys kind of evenly dividing cortex in the two dimension or two dimension array based on the flat map and just unbiased and inject everywhere, or you choose some strategic reason yeah. to focus a little bit more? So in in the first five years of the project, there were three tracer teams. Uh, one tracer team was focusing on the prefrontal cortex, another on the auditory uh, temporal region, and another was trying to do some sort of uh, general coverage. And uh, that, that was how that was working. And in the next five years, um, the plan is to have more general coverage. Yep. Okay, next question please. Hi, that was a fantastic talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I was I was curious because you, you talked about ants quite early on, which is the the an elastic registration yes. process. So because you've gone to the effort, the brilliant effort of individual atlasing, you've got all these um, anatomical components delineated. Have you attempted to do three D to three D mapping using ants? Because well, I've always been interested, how well does it register? And you could actually answer that question with dice coefficients and measures. Ah uh, yes, yeah, so I haven't quantified it based on the data that I showed you today. Okay. But uh, there is very, I mean, you you can see the variation appears more in the harder to register areas. So, especially for example, the the, the marmoset brain, the cortex is relatively smooth, but um, you you usually have the most trouble in the lateral fissure because in many small regions there. Um, yeah, but it, it's actually, with the marmoset, I found ants, it, it works. That you can normalize data, but the, the approach you take is the more information you can use to normalize, uh, even, even if that's coming from uh, expert annotations, the, the better. Um, I think if you want to get something perfect, you can't avoid that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions at this stage? Uh, get my cup, please. You know everything. So. <laughs> There's one thing that that that, that uh, came to my attention. I saw this injection in MT, uh, two injections, yeah. uh, one slightly, slightly more superior, yeah. um, and we got this uh, very distinct difference in connectivity pattern. Could you do you know? Uh, can you can you recall what large are the injection sites? What are how uh, large? What, what, what's the volume of the halo on the, on the, on the injection? Which leads yeah. me to the follow-up question: whether it would be actually indeed possible to study, study intrinsic connectivity with these injections? So, for the second part of the question, yes, definitely. I think I think this data will be great for studying this, especially with this. Um, one challenge is how how were we going to segment the the, the kind of um, the actual interrograde tracer and what we found with the, the AI technique is it, it's very good to pick up these very what faint axonal projections that you might miss if you're just trying to search through a very very huge image um, and for the size I don't know but I can share that with you later and there's also a publication on this actual data set that's that's Specifically focusing on this. So, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah.